funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association. Making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. And New Jersey Realtors, the voice of real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njrealtor.com. Tonight on NJ Spotlight News, damage control. Prosecutors in the Menendez trial try to clean up any doubt surrounding their star witness, Jose Uribe, after accusations of drugs and alcohol are raised in court. Plus, boardwalk crackdown. As summer begins and scenes of weekend teenage chaos ensue, State Senator Mike Testa looks to lay down the law. I tend to believe that a lot of parents just don't really they don't understand or want to believe, you know, what their kids are actually doing here. Also, broken promises, $100 million and a robust plan promised by the Murphy administration to eliminate lead in drinking water, but reporting shows much of it never got off the ground. And when we ask just to, like, speak to someone from the Department of Education or, a depart or the governor's office just to get an understanding of this, they declined to give us an interview. And transit woes. Commuter frustration is at an all-time high after weeks of train delays and cancellations. Lots of finger pointing going on, but who's to blame? NJ Transit and Amtrak are sort of like a married couple that get divorced but still live in the same house. NJ Spotlight News begins right now. From NJ PBS Studios, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venozzi. Good evening and thanks for joining us this Wednesday night. I'm Brianna Venozzi. Another key witness took the stand today in the federal corruption trial of Senator Bob Menendez. This time, it was his close friend and political ally, Philip Selinger, New Jersey's powerful U.S. attorney. Government lawyers peppered Selinger with questions about exactly how he got his job and whether he made any promises to Senator Menendez in return. Menendez is accused, among other charges, of trying to influence the state's top federal prosecutor from pursuing a case against his co-defendant, Fred Davies. The real estate developer was previously charged with bank fraud by the office Selinger now runs. His testimony followed a long day of work by the defense as they tried to discredit the prosecution's other star witness. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan has been inside the Manhattan courtroom for us all day and joins us live with the details. Brenda. Hey, how you doing, Brianna? Listen, today was the day that essentially the defense took its final pot shots at the star witness for the prosecution, Jose Uribe. And they tried to convince the jury that not only is Uribe a liar, which they went on, uh, they went on about yesterday and on Friday, but they tried to convince them that he's also a drunk who abuses Xanax. And they tried to do this to discredit his testimony. The defense attorney, Adam Fee, essentially challenged the accuracy of everything that Uribe has testified to. Um, in terms of his his liking to drink, that they showed cre uh, credit card receipts uh, that he had racked up at a bar in Teaneck. They also claimed that he was intoxicated on the night that he made this agreement with Senator Menendez, sat with him out on the patio behind the couple's ho home in Englewood Cliffs, and made the ask, said, please, can you help me with this situation? And that Menendez said, I will look into it. Menendez. Uh, also allegedly told Uribe, look, you better be careful because there are cops uh, looking for drunk drivers out here. And the inference to the jury is that Uribe was too intoxicated to really know what he was doing, to remember what he was doing, and to accurately represent this to the jury. Now, Uribe yeah. shot back. He said, look, I'm not sitting with a U.S. senator and to discuss a serious matter when I'm intoxicated and that Menendez did promise that quid pro quo. Did the prosecution, Bren, get another uh, a chance at, at sort of saving the reputation of their witness? They did. I mean, they had obviously uh, to do some cleanup and on redirect, that's what they did. They took Uribe 
point by point through this entire litany. Yes, it was a deal in exchange for, for Menendez's influence that Menendez in a phone call did confirm that thing you asked about. Uh, it's nothing. I give you peace. And, and the peace is code word for this is resolved. Now, Uribe's told the jury, my only job while on this witness stand is to tell you the truth. And he just reaffirmed that, that he was not stretching things. Sure. He was just there to give them the truth. Let me story. ask you about this other witness, Brenda, another prominent official, Philip Selinger. What's happened so far in his testimony? Well, um, the, he's the sitting U.S. attorney uh, for New Jersey. He's known uh, Robert Menendez for a long time. Uh, he helped him campaign uh, for Congress. He was a fundraiser. He's been a friend of the senators uh, for years and years. They would golf together. But apparently the senator told him at one point that he was unhappy about how the a former U.S. attorney in New Jersey was handling a case involving Fred Davies. Davies is a developer who is a co-defendant in this case, and Menendez was indicating that he wasn't happy about how the U.S. attorney was handling the case. Now, when they discussed whether Menendez would nominate Selinger to be New Jersey's new U.S. attorney, there was never a direct question, according to Selinger, not an ask. Uh, about any case involving Davies. However, he did indicate in a phone call afterwards that, you know, I might have to recuse myself because I've been involved in lawsuits yeah. uh, that had uh, clients involving Davies, and therefore I might not be able to do anything for you. And sure. that apparently convinced, you know, the the inferences that it convinced Menendez not to nominate him. So it sounds that, like the next that's chapter, the, ongoing the next discussion. phase for this prosecution. Brenda Flanagan for us in Manhattan. Brenda, thanks so much. Wildwood's police department issued a warning to the public on social media today about an unsanctioned beach pop-up party being promoted for this weekend. It's the type of event Shoretown mayors say they're having to deal with more frequently, along with teen rowdiness on boardwalks that's already led to dozens of arrests before the summer has even gotten to full swing. How to handle those disturbances was the topic of a hearing today with local and state leaders. Senior political correspondent David Cruz reports. Tourism at the shore is a $50 billion industry, and scenes like this just aren't good for business. On a virtual hearing organized by Republican Senator Mike Testa, public officials from Ocean City and Wildwood vented their frustration in what at times sounded a little bit like a scene out of Footloose. Young individuals who were openly smoking marijuana, openly drinking alcoholic beverages that we know are illegal for them to consume, especially in places of public. I tend to believe that a lot of parents just don't really, they don't understand or want to believe, you know, what their kids are actually doing here. Um, some of the, I mean, some of the kids are almost naked. But officials ping pong between things are out of control to things are not that bad. The hearing was long on hand wringing, but short on specifics. Is it the breakdown of social norms? Are the parents to blame? Are pleas being handcuffed? Yes to all, according to those on the virtual hearing, like Jody Levchuk, councilman in Ocean City, where someone was stabbed in a boardwalk fight over the Memorial Day weekend. It is the perception. The perception is is a hundred times worse than the reality, of course. You know, the, re the reality is, is we are a wildly safe town. This, this stabbing was amongst a group of people who knew each other. They had an altercation. It had nothing to do with the safety of our town. It wasn't a random person walking down the boardwalk who who got stabbed or mugged or something like that. Maybe there should be a law in where the parents, uh, I saw, just saw two parents put in prison because their kid took a gun and shot somebody. Maybe that needs to be handled in that manner also. We used to be on the side of every police car to protect and to serve. We have to give the tools to law enforcement to allow them to protect us, allow them to serve their communities. Which locals and tourists alike would likely agree with. But Jim Sullivan of the ACLU says, not if that means you pin a criminal record on every kid who acts like a jerk on the boardwalk, which police admit is the most common crime committed by teens on the boardwalk. 
criminalizing youth um, has study after study shows how damaging that is to youth, right? Um, it, it one doesn't solve the problem that, that we're purporting to do what we want to fix. Um, but it also leads to worse outcomes for, for youth that are criminalized, right? Many of them end up in the adult system. Um, and, and, and that's not the route we want to go, right? I think that there are alternatives to, to criminalizing youth when we're having problems down the shore. A panel of Republican lawmakers and officials from Republican districts can't help but have a partisan sheen. Democratic Senator Vin Gopal said he passed on an invite to join in. The last, uh, you know, I know Senator Testa was at, the, at a press conference with Governor Murphy in Monmouth County at our boardwalk a couple of weeks ago to praise the boardwalk funds. So how much of this is, is politics, do you think, Senator? Probably all of it. Testa says the panel will meet again and he'll push for tougher laws on kids who drink or smoke on the boardwalk or the beach and that he'll try to make parents more directly responsible for the actions of their children. But as to the age-old question, what's the matter with kids today? No one on the mostly middle-aged panel seemed to have an answer for that one. I'm David Cruz, NJ Spotlight News. Former President Donald Trump's New Jersey businesses could take a hit from his recent felony conviction. Attorney General Matt Platkin's office is reviewing whether to revoke liquor licenses at his three golf clubs. Now that Trump's been found guilty of 34 felony charges in the New York hush money case. A state law prevents anyone convicted of what's called a crime of moral turpitude from owning liquor licenses. The law also requires the person to be of reputable character. In response to the inquiry from the AG's office, the Trump Organization said in a statement, the former president is not the holder of the licenses, which are still in good standing as of today. Trump's golf courses are located in Bedminster, Colts Neck, and Pine Hill. The statement went on to say probes like the one from the attorney general do nothing but, quote, harm the thousands of hardworking Americans who get their livelihoods through those businesses. Five years ago, Governor Murphy unveiled a strategy to address alarming reports of lead contamination in the drinking water of public schools. It was a public health emergency that exposed hundreds of thousands of students to toxic metals. The administration pledged $100 million to eliminate the problem through robust testing, replacing aging water service lines, and creating a central database so the public could access test results in each and every school. But an investigation by Ian Sheeran for Jersey vindicator found that plan never got off the ground and those students are still at risk. Ian joins me in the studio for the latest. Ian, this was a fascinating report about the states, as you call it, war on lead. Mm. What did the governor promise that day he took to the podium? Yeah, yeah well, you pretty much summed it up. He said that uh, this is a big problem and we got to get all hands on deck. And I have a three-prong solution that should become a national model when I'm done. And that is one, we gotta do more testing. We gotta test every three years in the schools instead of every six years. Number two, we have to create uh, a centralized state-run database that has all of the testing results in it so that parents and public can easily access what's going on at their school. And third, I am dedicating $100 million from a recently secured uh, bond act, $100 million to start fixing the problems, physically remediating the problems in the schools. What out of any of those prongs yeah. has the state achieved? Prong one, testing. He achieved testing. They've been testing in the schools, but prongs two and three never really happened. So they're testing, but as a parent, I can't necessarily access that information easily or look at a big database where I can compare it. There is no the centralized risk. database. You can go to your local school district's website, but that is an e a bit of an Easter egg hunt in some places. How much of that $100 million has been spent to 6. replace? 6.6 million. So what answer did the state give you as to why that small fraction has been used? They told us that, um, I, th I don't know if this is the exact quote, but I think it is, we can't make the school districts apply for these grants. 
The that, money's there, but we can't make them ask for it. That seems to be ironic because wouldn't it be the state to hold them, their feet to the fire in order to? Yes, the state uh, DEP, the Department of Health is, is, is charged with protecting the safety of our school children and our citizens. So how pervasive of a problem is it? Because Newark, for New Jersey anyway, became the poster child of here's an issue, we're going to replace the, the water service lines to mm. homes, mm. we're on it, we're ahead of schedule. Mm. How pervasive is this and, and is it outside just urban areas where we tend to be? It sure is. That's what kind of set this whole thing off. This was like coming at, uh, right after Newark had become a national story and it's with its lead uh, water contamination problems. It was right up there it, with Flint, Michigan and uh, notoriety. And so, so this uh, uh, caused a bit of concern. Uh, it was a bit of a public health crisis. And so with that backdrop, um, uh, they, they they started examining testings and saw that it wasn't just Newark, it wasn't just urban areas as commonly believed, but it was in suburban and it was all over the state. 250,000 students you wrote were potentially exposed to this. And uh, the state is saying, hey, not our fault, the schools don't want to participate. Yeah, that's what the state said. That was their answer. So, And when we ask just to like speak to someone from the Department of Education or a depart the, or the governor's office just to get an understanding of this, they declined to give us an interview. Ian, great investigative reporting. Of course, everyone can check it out. Uh, Jersey Vindicator, thanks so much for coming in. Appreciate. Israel and Hamas are being accused of committing war crimes and human rights abuses since the October 7th attacks that spurred the war in Gaza. Two scathing independent reports to the U.N. Human Rights Council say both sides have mounted attacks against civilians, resulting in, quote, murder or willful killings. Israel specifically was called out for crimes against humanity because of the massive Palestinian death toll. The Israeli government dismissed those findings, blaming the reports on on anti-Israel bias. Meanwhile, a U.S.-backed Israeli proposal for a ceasefire and hostage deal appears to be in limbo. Here in New Jersey today, the Newark Solidarity Coalition spoke out publicly for the first time since its encampment was disbanded this weekend. The Gaza War protesters had been sleeping in tents on the lawn of Rutgers, Newark, for 40 days. It was the last remaining among pro-Palestinian encampments on college campuses here. Activists spoke about the use of armed police to remove them from a peaceful demonstration and reiterated their initial demands from the university to divest from companies with ties to Israel and put more resources into the Newark community. And because we wholeheartedly believe Rutgers Newark's own commitment to being a decolonial and social justice institution would jump at the opportunity to divest from genocide to reinvest in the community of Newark through land, housing, legal educational and medicinal justice. We have time and time again invited both Rutgers and the city of Newark to stand with us on the right side of history. In our Spotlight on Business report tonight, call it another miracle on the Hudson. The federal government on Tuesday signed off on more than $6.8 billion in funding for the Gateway Tunnel project to build new rail tunnels under the Hudson River. It's the final piece of funding for the long-delayed project and the largest ever federal commitment to a mass transit project, meaning the federal government is on the hook for roughly three-quarters of the $16 billion price tag. Planners for Gateway say they've passed the point of no return. All systems are go to begin construction as soon as this year, wrapping up by 2035. It's a bit of good news following an otherwise maddening few weeks for transit riders whose commutes have been casualties of massive delays and cancellations, underscoring problems with the rail systems that have lingered for years and finger pointing from transportation agencies. So two of our reporters dug into what's to blame for the problems. It's a good question. Question, and they join me now, budget and finance writer John Reitmeyer and Washington correspondent Ben Hulock. Good to have you both in studio, a really important thing to look at. So Ben, yes, there seems to always be confusion among the public about whose fault it is when these overhead wire issues happen, signal delays happen, 
New Jersey Transit is actually just a tenant, yeah? Right. It's, it can be really baffling. You're sitting in your, on your train or maybe you're waiting on the platform and you're looking at an NJ Transit uh, sign on the side of a train going by. And um, it feels like you're using NJ Transit, but really it is Amtrak that owns the rail and operates the rail. And to use an analogy that a source uh, we, we talked to for the story told me, NJ Transit and Amtrak are sort of like a married couple that get divorced but still live in the same house. So they're using the fridge, they're using Nightmare all the, situation. All, right. And there's a lot of finger pointing. And uh, there's blame to go around. A lot of these issues, of course, have been uh, long, long going, decades in the making. But it's also aging infrastructure that's a problem. And John, there was a, a big infusion of federal cash, allegedly, to help some of these problems. Where did the money get spent? Yeah, we have a lot of things happening at the same time here because NJ Transit has an operating budget and NJ Transit also has a capital budget and different uh, levels of funding have come in and, and there is a lot of federal funding coming through the system as a result of a, a law passed a few years ago at the federal level for infrastructure, including rail infrastructure. And of course, uh, NJ Transit has received a lot of federal dollars in recent years as pandemic aid in mm -hmm. the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. And it really created a big headache for transit agencies across the country because what you saw is the um, ridership dropped off during the pandemic. And as people continue to spend a lot of time working kind of maybe in a hybrid schedule where they're going to the office some and working from home some. And so NJ Transit has inflation that it's dealing with like a lot of us that's putting pressure on its operating budget. And at the same time, it doesn't have ridership yet back to what it was, where it's a it was at. catch 22. Well, we're still digging financially uh, out of the pandemic that really <clears throat> cut a deep scar in the country. Um, on the New Jersey side, I would pass it over to John. Yeah, and, and NJ Transit faces those challenges. You know, the, the level of funding that comes out of the state budget, and there's a new state budget that's a, about to get done in Trenton in the next few weeks, is always an issue for NJ Transit's operations. And the governor has a proposal right now to try to get more money for NJ Transit operations. But, you know, a lot of this investment in the infrastructure itself, even when money's been allocated, it can take a lot of time to, to actually, you know, when is that new tunnel actually going to open and when will people start to see the benefits of that new tunnel? It's years away from right. now, even though we celebrate these milestones of grant agreements and things like that. Yeah, and, and what will that do to alleviate some of these pressures? We are talking, of course, about a decade in the making. Yeah, I think on the functioning side, anytime you're updating the infrastructure itself, that will probably translate into better service and so that that would help and then when you're increasing capacity which is something that's the goal of uh, the the new tunnels even the new what's being built uh, the portal bridge over the Hackensack River is supposed to increase capacity and that allows you to move more people at, at the same time versus where we're at now. Ben what did our congressional delegation have to say about this? You talked to a bunch of them. I did and I really talked to folks in South Jersey Rob Menendez um, is on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee in the House. He said, he actually said New Jersey Transit needs to uh, step up and provide more funding. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, this was maybe a month ago when I spoke with him. Um, I talked with Andy Kim, Jeff Van Drew, Donald Norcross, so ex exclusively Southern, uh, Southern state folks, except for Menendez. They, in, in general, they said they actually all ride NJ Transit um, pretty regularly. And uh, I would just underscore this point. Federally, this could be the last big cash injection from Congress for the foreseeable future. The law John referenced, which every member in New Jersey voted for, was passed in 2021, this big infrastructure law. It provided $66 billion nationwide for rail. Depend on how Congress shakes out in the next Congress, or Congress after that, or who wins the White House, this could be it for potentially decades. Big question mark there. Big question. Ben Hulock, John Reitmeyer, great reporting. Thank you to you both for coming in. My pleasure. Thank you. Turning to Wall Street, the Federal Reserve today decided to hold interest rates steady, which means they'll remain at a 23-year high. The central bank also scaled back its estimate for the number of rate cuts we should expect, signaling just one is on tap before the end of the year. Here's how the markets reacted to the news. Support for the Business Report is provided by Experience the Vibrancy of Newark's Arts and Education District and Halsey Street. Halsey, a neighborhood built on heart and hustle. 
Visit HalseyN-W-K.com for the 2024 Halsey Fest schedule. And by NJMEP, a partner to New Jersey's manufacturing industry, focused on productivity, performance, and strategic development. More on NJMEP.org. That does it for us tonight, but don't forget to download the NJ Spotlight News podcast so you can listen anytime. I'm Brianna Venozzi for the entire NJ Spotlight News team. Thanks for being with us. Have a great evening. We'll see you back here tomorrow night. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. New Jersey Realtors, the voice of real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njrealtor.com and by the PSCG Foundation. I'm Gloria Monks, 2024 president of New Jersey Realtors. Whether it's guiding first time buyers through the home buying process or securing space for small business owners, New Jersey Realtors have been helping their clients through real estate transactions for more than a century. No matter what your unique needs are, there is a knowledgeable New Jersey Realtor for you. Learn more at njrealtor.com slash find.